Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks all for coming. Uh, those of you that are here in person at the RSA, but also those of you that are joining us online uh, this lunchtime, all of you can join along using online, using the hashtag RSA Messengers to ask questions and join the debate. Uh, my name's Ian Burbage. I work here at the RSA. I'm an associate director where my work covers a range of things, including how we can apply a range of insights, such as those we're going to hear about today, to our wider work and how we can apply our model of change in practice. Today's talk is timely and topical, and I know it's going to be super interesting. So um, we're going to hear from Steve and Joe about their research into what makes a good messenger or even what makes someone a poor messenger. Um, Stephen is the CEO of Influence at Work uh, and visiting Professor of Behavioural Science at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. Widely authored and published, uh, he's a guest lecturer on programmes at the LSE, Judge Business School, Cambridge and Harvard. Uh, Joe is a doctoral researcher at University College London, a visiting researcher at MIT and an associate consultant for Influence at Work, equally widely published. Uh, Joe has a master's degree in social cognition. So uh, ideally, these, these guys are ideally placed to unpack what it uh, takes to make a good messenger. So I'm not going to stand in the way of hearing their insights. Uh, I'm going to let them be the messenger for uh, today's session. So uh, Steve and Joe. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come to the RSA. I am a fellow myself, so it's uh, wonderful to uh, come and speak and uh, spend some time with some fellow fellows, I, I guess is what uh, one would call ourselves. So I guess we have all experienced that situation where a message that we've delivered hasn't been heard, uh, whether it's our family and friends dismissing our idea of which holiday resort or venue we should go to next year, or perhaps our colleagues at work who dismiss an idea that we come up with. It can be frustrating when we're not heard. And that frustration can rapidly turn to irritation when someone else comes along, maybe a couple of days or a couple of weeks later, and says the exact same thing that we've been saying. And all of a sudden, the idea or point of view that was ours and that was roundly dismissed is all of a sudden enthusiastically embraced. We've all had that situation. And I think that situation exemplifies something uh, important about the research that Joe and I have conducted on these messenger effects. And it's this idea that I would say even increasingly what's being said often matters not as much as who is saying what is being said, even when those things are the exact same. The content of the message is exactly the same. Some messengers are able to convey a message that other messengers who are communicating the exact same facts are unable to. Okay. Now, the implications of that, of course, aren't just apparent in our family and friends' circles and societies. They're not just implicated at work. They have much broader societal impacts as well. You know, we live today in a world where proven facts, verifiable data, actual truths are freely and widely available, and yet there are still self-confident uh, self ignoramuses that are all too often believed. There are thoughtful experts that go dismissed. It does seem to me that increasingly looking and sounding right in this crazy information overloaded world in which we live in is being seen as important as actually being right. And the implication of that, of course, is that the messenger has now increasingly become the message. When a messenger delivers a message, something intriguing happens to the audience that are recipients of their message that messenger gets connected to the content of that message. And it can be very hard sometimes to separate out what is being said from who is saying what is actually being said. Those two things become converged. And so one of the questions that Joe and I have been increasingly intrigued at answering is, if we were to put to, to one side the content of a message, forget for a moment what is actually being said and its relative truth, wisdom, or falsehood? What are the factors that most incline audiences 
to pay attention to a particular communicator. And what we find broadly in the research, which has now been ongoing for some 70 years now, where researchers have been looking at the individual characteristics and traits of what makes an effective messenger, is we can largely conclude that there are two broad categories of messengers in society. There are what we call hard messengers. Hard messengers are the messengers that are able to get their messages heard because they are able to signal to their audience that they have some form of status over the group that they are communicating to. And in contrast, there are also soft messengers. Soft messengers don't seem to get their message approved or accepted because they have status over their audience, but rather because they have some connectedness with their audience. I want to talk briefly for a few moments about these hard traits. Um, there are four, in fact. Uh, socioeconomic position, competence, dominance, and physical attractiveness. Socioeconomic position, this is the idea that if we see certain characters, if we see certain messengers that have an elevated position in our society, they have fame, they have fortune, they have some form of status or hierarchy, there may be an inference that they are likely to be more useful, valuable to listen to. That's why we have CEOs and chairmen of organizations. <coughs> Celebrities, I guess, are probably the obvious example of uh, a messenger that has socioeconomic position, and therefore we attend to and often listen to them more. This isn't necessarily a good thing. In 2016, the Chinese health department scrambled to contain a virus of rumors that were uh, sparked on WhatsApp by an Asian pop star, 18 years of age, who without evidence and contrary to all the available health data, suggested on WhatsApp that anyone that received the flu vaccine, 90% of them were likely to catch the virus. There's an example of how the socioeconomic position of that communicator conveys and has a large impact on an audience, regardless of the fact that that particular message was an absolute falsehood, a nonsense. Competence is another way in which we decide or infer whether or not we should listen to a messenger. If we see or perceive that some communicator has some form of competence, we may be more inclined to subsequently attain, attend rather more to the information that they actually present to us. Again, it's perceived competence. It's not necessarily actual competence. Um, and as a result, there are some very interesting and sometimes strange examples of how someone perceived to have competence carries sway in a situation where otherwise their message would be largely ridiculed. Here's a good example. Yes, you've read that right. The strange case of rectal earache. There's a hospital pharmacy journal. It's been published uh, every month for some 35 years now. Um, one of the columns, the most perhaps popular column in this uh, journal, is an opportunity for healthcare professionals to write in and essentially report on errors, mistakes, and mishaps that have been caused in their medical centers anonymously in the hope that their error can provide a lesson for others. When we saw one of the columns titled The Strange Case of Rectal Earache, um, our ears pricked up, as you can imagine. The situation was there was a patient, an inpatient in hospital, who was complaining of a painful ear. The nurse rightly called the duty doctor, who came and examined the patient, examined the patient, saw that he did in fact have an inflamed middle ear, and prescribed some anti-inflammatory eardrops. Nothing unusual about that, except when he then went to write the prescription on the patient's notes, Instead of fully writing the instructions, place three drops in patient's right ear, he abbreviated the word right. Okay? The medical abbreviation for the word right is a simple capital R. Place three drops in the patient's rear. This makes no sense whatsoever. The nurse should have known this as well, but... As my colleague Robert Cialdini, a long-term colleague of mine, has astutely said, in many cases where a competent agent speaks, what would otherwise make sense becomes an irrelevance. And the nurse duly asks the patient concerned to adopt the position. Two others, dominance. Dominant messengers seek to 
impose on their audience. They don't necessarily care about facts. They don't necessarily care about the content or wisdom of their message. They have one MO, and their MO is to win at all costs. They can be brash. They can be domineering. They can be demanding. Which sparks the question, why in a modern day society would we listen to dispositionally dominant personalities? But what's interesting is, from a very, very early age, there is a deep-seated belief etched in all of us that to the victor goes the spoils. Research conducted with toddlers as young as 10 months old register, register surprise and shock on their faces when they see a scenario where a dominant character is beaten by an underdog. They register surprise and shock at that. It seems that we have a deeply ingrained belief in all of us that to the victor goes the spoils. And we are especially likely to listen to and attend to those domineering messengers in situations of conflict and crisis. No surprise, therefore, that we see in our society that those very dominant, domineering types of characters and leaders are often citing and igniting fear and conflict within us. Maybe it doesn't even exist because they know that that is the optimal environment for where their domineering, their domineering personality is likely to be listened to. And finally, the fourth of our hard traits, physical attractiveness. It's a simple fact, shame I recognize, but a simple fact that those that are genetically blessed, that are physically attractive, are afforded significant advantages in life. They are listened to more. They are attended to more. Economic research shows that they're likely to be paid more as well, often some 10 to 15% more than their average uh, uh, looking peers over the course of a lifetime, which has actually sparked uh, some to suggest that we should start to think about policies that perhaps level the playing field in that instance. So in our research, we have found these four universal characteristics or traits to be the levers, the most important universal, universal aspects that essentially signal that a messenger has some status over their audience. Those are the hard effects. But there's a more bright side to the argument as well here. We don't always listen to those messengers that simply have some form of status. We also listen to those messages that are softer in characteristic. And uh, in regard to that, I'm going to hand over now to Joe, who's going to talk a little bit about the soft traits that we've actually found in our research. So, Joe. <coughs> yeah, so as Steve said, in contrast to the hard messengers who wield some form of status, there are also soft messengers who have a connectedness with their audience. They don't seek to try and get ahead of others, but to get along with others. And while the hard messenger uh, may look like this, a soft messenger typically evokes a warm, fuzzy response um, that draws people in. They're not attractive necessarily, but we're attracted to them for this reason. Um, and just to show how strong a connection can be, a small feeling of connectedness with another, I can give you one quick example. Um, so take Grigory Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia, not one of history's most likable characters. And yet, um, in a study conducted by Robert Cialdini and John Finch, they showed that one group of ASU students actually weren't too averse to him. And there was a reason why. They presented these students with Rasputin's history, a detailed kind of list of how he was an arch manipulator, um, and had a malign influence over the Russian royal family and thus Russian politics. But they also included one piece of information in half of these uh, participants' information sheet, which was that they surreptitiously suggested that they shared the same birthday as Rasputin. And this small connection that they then felt did not then lead them to elevate Rasputin to hero status. They didn't fawn over him and love him, but it did reduce the negative view that people had of him. 
And imagine if this kind of inconsequential bond, such as a shared birthday, can lead people to view a nasty character like Rasputin slightly less negatively. Imagine what less inconsequential bonds can do. And we see it played out all the time. Um, recruiters spontaneously lean towards those candidates who have some similarity towards themselves, such as um, age or background or views and attitudes. And salespeople are more likely to be successful if they first highlight a commonality that they share with their potential customers. So I'm going to kind of talk about the four traits that we identified um, in our research which lead people to feel connected. The first is warmth. And warm messengers don't seek to demonstrate their status over others, but rather their benevolence. They show that they care and they express positive regard for others. They smile at them and they're friendly. Um, they don't try and get respect for themselves, but rather they defer respect and admiration onto others. And you know, you can see this in the way that we embed warmth into our language with humans every day. We all do this. Nobody finishes a conversation with Siri or Alexa by saying, you take care now. But we almost invariably will signal our warmth through polite words and phrases to other humans. Um, the second trait is vulnerability. Vulnerability is the idea that we can expose who we really are inside and connect with people on a more human level. Um, we, we kind of take the opposite approach of the dominant forceful messenger and instead show where we might have weaknesses or kind of fears or uh, insecurities. And that actually evokes in people um, a strong feeling of empathy, sometimes guilt and feelings of responsibility and encourages them to help. So rather than sh showing people why they might want to listen to our advice, we instead ask them uh, for a request or for help. And in that sense, it can produce powerful effects too. Um, for example, contestants in talent shows will often do better if they have some weakness or deficiency. Um, and good lawyers know how to present their clients to somebody who is struggling and may have suffered in the past and came from a tough background. One study, in fact, found that if people went into a busy line at a train station, um, and asked to cut in line and said, I'll give you some money, people would let them cut in line, but they didn't actually take the money. The money was a signal of their need and desperation. And instead, they just let them in for free because they could see this person must really need to get cut in line. The third trait is trustworthiness. And trust is crucial to any human relationship. It's hard to have prosperous economic exchanges or productive workplace collaborations or even successful romantic relationships without it. Um, but there are two broad forms of trust. So we have competence-based trust on the one hand, which is our confidence in a messenger's capabilities. Um, and on the other hand, we have integrity-based trust, which is our belief in them to uphold good moral standards, even if a temptation to violate them arises. Um, and what other research shows is that trust and truthfulness are not necessarily the same thing. So while we may respond to those who, who are kind of factually inaccurate um, as still trustworthy in some cases. And this is because rather than uh, looking at fact and evidence, which is what you do for truth, trustworthiness relies on broader, more vaguer assessments. And you see this played out every day where People can lie and yet remain trustworthy with their kind of key supporters who may share their views and um, actually believe that underneath the lies, they know what their leader or friend stands for and they believe in, in that um, purpose. And finally, the last soft effect is charisma. So charisma is defined as a compelling attractiveness or charm that inspires devotion in others. But how exactly do charismatic speakers achieve this? One way is they're able to articulate a collective vision that binds their audience together um, under a superordinate goal, and they become seen as part of that group and as the leader of it. Um, another is surgency. So you will have noticed Steve talking. He's far better at this than I am. But uh, when a speaker presents with enthusiasm, optimism, and positivity, they are able to kind of 
um, invoke in their audience this emotion. And actually, we see that nonverbal signals of behavior do this too. So sp speakers on the website ted.com TED um, typically get much more views if they use more hand gestures. In fact, those that are rated uh, higher on the same subject um, in terms of the views that they receive typically have about twice as many hand gestures as comparable talks um, on the same topic. So I just want to kind of close up by saying these eight traits all reliably influence whether or not we will listen to somebody. Um, and in turn, that will affect actually what we believe, the information that the, we then come to see as our own beliefs and the attitudes we hold, the values that we have, um, are formed based on who we listen to. In turn, that's going to affect how we behave and subsequently who we become as people. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much for listening to our talk. Thanks, Jay, Steve. Uh, so let's unpack some of those uh, ideas then before we'll open it out to questions from the audience because I'm sure there are loads. Um, so let's just think a little bit about um, what it takes to be a good messenger in terms of, uh, and there's some good examples in the book about how there's a, a messenger bias. So if with a, you know, we, we, we met over a behavioral science evening at LSE. Um, and so as a behavioral scientist, of course, I have to talk about bias, right? So let's just unpack that a little bit, this notion of bias and how you can transfer traits from a particular messenger into areas in yeah. which they're not qualified to speak. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's super fascinating. So uh, you, you would like to think that when we ask the question, who should we listen to, um, uh, the response to that should be, well, clearly we should listen to the person that has good facts, has good evidence, has, you know, uh, a, a warranted position to take and, and, and to actually state. But that often is anywhere near the truth in that instance, we'll, we'll often just use one of these features. Oh, I, I see this person has some sort of connection with me, or they seem like they're an expert, or they, they, they appear charismatic. Um, and we use that as an initial cue to essentially open our ears so that their message doesn't fall on, on deaf ears. But then what's interesting is, uh, and this is the work, of the age-old work now of Edmund Thorndike, um, the psychologist who... Uh, coined the halo effect term, this idea that when we see that someone has one trait, it's quite easy for us to then infer that they have lots of other traits that have absolutely nothing to do with what they're saying in the first instance. We'll use our judgment, a single judgment about a messenger to infer lots of other things about them. So for example, you know, if we meet someone at a conference um, and we come to learn that that person happens to know someone that we also know, that and that person is someone we like, it's easy to then to infirm that this person that we just met is probably quite likable as well. Uh, the reverse is true, of course, as well. So if we meet someone for the first time and they know someone that we actually dislike, it's a little easier for us to then dislike them as well, even though there's, no, contrary to any evidence that's, that's there, whether we should like them or not in that instance. So, yeah, what we find is that although Joe and I have actually set out, you know, these eight universal... Uh, messenger traits for hard and for soft, the interplay between them and the noticing of one or the signaling of one that then has an impact on our judgment on another uh, are intertwined, absolutely. And as a, as a messenger, if you like, uh, to, to what extent has your research shown that people are able to flex between uh, either, you know, the different, the eight different characteristics? Is there, is there a way you can go from hard to soft messenger types or styles as an individual? Uh, or are people generally confined within a dominant trait, do you find? Mm -hmm. Certainly people get stereotyped into what they are. And, you know, we form expectations about people's traits very early on. And although we do update those, um, they, they tend to stick around. First impressions are powerful. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, most of the research um, tends to be focusing on one trait at a time. And we don't really have that ability to um, look at people over situations and, and compare, you know, how are they flexible? Are they able to adapt to the situation? But I personally think they are. And I think that those who are very effective messengers do so in a very adaptive and successful way. So you might imagine that if you're kind of at a talk and you're, uh, you know, giving a talk or you're a leader of an organization, you want to appear confident and inspire that kind of devotion and um, 
and uh, in, in your audience. But at the same time, if you're sort of that same person might be with a friend who's just broken up with their partner, they're not going to take the same approach, um, and they shouldn't. They should kind of express positive regard, show empathy, um, and, and take a more softer style. For sure. And do you find uh, in, the, in the research that you've, that you've done that there's any kind of correlation or link into sort of more traditional personality traits in terms of, you know, I might think that uh, an extrovert is perhaps more likely to be a dominant messenger type. Uh, is that the case, or, or is there yeah. not, not yeah. such so a... So, actually, uh, on charisma, then, certainly, surgency is of the kind of big five personality traits associated with extroversion. So extroverts are more likely to come across as enthusiastic, positive, outgoing, and that um, translates into charisma. Um, I think the other one is agreeableness, where we have a strong link with warmth. So those who are seen as friendlier tend to score highly on personality measures of agreeableness. They're also seen by others as warmer. So I think that the links are there. Yeah. So I'm going to open this out for questions because uh, I've got loads, but I'm sure people in the room have too. Uh, so let's have a, some, some hands and we'll get people uh, walking around with a mic to ask some questions. And while the, while the mic goes around, I think finally I just want to think about uh, as three guys sitting on the stage. You touch on gender in your book. Uh, there's a, a, maybe a stereotype that males will be uh, harder messengers by default and maybe women are, are softer messengers. Is, is that the case? Is that something you found? And are there things we can do uh, to sort of yeah. address those stereotypes? Yeah. So, yeah, so I think the first thing when, when we address any question about gender is, is, is to clearly point out there are three guys sitting on the stage here talking about this. And, um, um, so, so in that context, yeah, I, I think it, it, it does seem to be the case, and certainly the evidence that we've um, you know, um, unearthed here is, is that there does seem to be a a general expectation that you know the uh, guys will typically be associated with those kind of harder types of traits, um, and 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 women with the with the softer traits. Although, I think it's really important to point out one really encouraging and important um, exception here, which is and Joe, you'll need to remind me of the name of the researcher, but there has been some recent research that suggests that when it comes to competence. Um, both genders are equal to each other in their perception of competence, and if anything, actually, the emerging evidence is that women uh, are actually seen as a little more competent than men in that instance. I don't know if you want to add to that, but I think that's what we've largely yeah, seen. Yeah, no, it's a, um, so it's Alice Eagley, I think, okay. is the researcher name, but she conducted a huge um, meta-analysis of surveys that had looked at the gender question and how they were perceived from... 1945 through to 2018. Um, and what she found was that over the last even 30 or 40 years, there's been this big shift in perceptions of competence of women. But two have stayed largely the same, and those are the male uh, tendency to be seen as more dominant and the female tendency to be seen as more socially harmonious and warmer. And I think that does still have a big effect. So um, you can see you know, even though women are doing more degrees, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, and are equally likely to get entry-level jobs, when they start getting to the top, then those stereotypes really kick in, and we expect the prototypical leader to be that confident, hard, typical male stereotype. Um, and they get, they, they get promoted more often to that the role of CEO, whereas women tend to go for HR and PR. Well, that's where they get pigeonholed. What's, what's that adage? It said that, it said that um, if there were more women leaders, there would be less wars. Um, I, I think we'd probably take a slightly different uh, take on that. I should say if there were more women leaders, there'd actually be less wars in that instance. Uh, it kind of does define that hard and soft Definitely. playoff there. Brilliant. Okay, let's take a couple of questions at a time from the room. Thanks very much. <coughs> Malcolm Dean, ex Guardian. So could you? Tell me what you've discovered on, what, what you think has been discovered on loyalty and belief in different newspaper readerships. Um, not to be judged by the readers' numbers, but uh, their loyalty. There have been ch checks on that, and then there have been, it would be interesting to have your views 
of those surveys where um, people who read the news get very high marks compared to the hardworking reporters below them. And there was another question a little bit further forward. Yep. Yes, um, you have deliberately left out any names, but I was wondering whether you have any comments on, say, Mark Antony, Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, and uh, Mrs. Merkel. <laughs> yeah. So I guess in response to the first question, um, so my own research actually looks, uh, I should say my, mine and Eloise who sat in the front row, um, looks at how people uh, view those of similar political ideology to themselves and whether they're more likely to listen to them even on tasks that are completely apolitical or on topics that have no resemblance to the political domain. And what we find is that as soon as you start realizing that somebody shares your views a lot, so we ask them questions such as, um, do you think building a wall along the southern border of the US would reduce violent crime? And people would either say yes or no, and then they'd see other people playing the game. And unbeknownst to them, they were actually algorithms programmed to respond similarly or dissimilarly 80% of the time. Um, what we found was that those who agreed with them tend to be rated as more competent on a completely separate task that we designed to have no bearing on political views. So they were categorizing geometric shapes. We, we purposefully tried to make it as separate as possible. Um, and, and they viewed them as more competent at this task, even though they had all the evidence in front of them to know that those who were dissimilar to them politically were sometimes actually more accurate on this task. So what you see is actually in our study a kind of blending in people's minds where it's this halo effect. You see somebody as uh, similar to you in one way you have a positive response to them. You then view them positively on another trait that actually it has no bearing on. And I think the same is true in media um, in, in terms of what you read. You, you have this halo effect where you believe everything The Guardian says if you're a Guardian reader um, and the same on the, you know, on the right. Um, Shall I, I'll leave you to the second question. Yeah, that's, I'll say, yeah. <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, we, we, we've deliberately not named names today. Um, in, in the book, clearly, there are characters, uh, both current and from history, that uh, exemplify one or, or more of these traits. Um, you know, you, you talked about Adolf Hitler is, you know, seen by many to be uh, a very charismatic uh, communicator. You know, regardless of... His intent, you know, he had that ability to uh, get a large number of people to be behind a single vision and goals, typically what that defines that, that charismatic leader. Um, I'll, I'll say it now, uh, we have a president in the United States that seems to uh, exemplify one of these traits in particular. Uh, you know, he's a demanding, dominant type of character. Um, and what we find interesting about uh, the, the current U.S. president is that you know, he, he also exemplifies this idea that um, he can often hawk falsehoods and fictitious claims. And going back a little bit towards the, the question that you were actually asking, manage to increase his trustworthiness within um, a, a group of his supporters. Um, it's, it's really interesting how... Um, certain groups are willing for their leaders to out, outwardly lie and peddle falsehoods. And at the same time, uh, provided those falsehoods are largely in line with you know, the goals of that organization, the norms of that particular supporting group, they actually elevate their trustworthiness uh, to them. It actually buys them group credits for the future. Um, there's a, a, an astonishing example, actually. In, in 2013, there was a survey conducted in the United States that found that just over 70% of white evangelicals, so groups that are largely associated with uh, the Republican Party and Republican supporting policies, seven, over, just over 70% um, agreed strongly with the idea that uh, a leader, a figurehead, should uphold strong moral and ethical standards. Okay. Uh, the weekend after the 2016 inauguration, that same group figure was 30%. So 
there does seem to be some elasticity to um, truth and who we then subsequently assign trustworthiness to in that instance. You know, if, if we've got a figurehead or a leader that is delivering the kind of messages um, that we have signed up to, um, then we are willing to, you know, essentially allow them significant license um, as long as they don't deviate necessarily from uh, the core of, of our particular group here. We, and then we subsequently provide them with get out of jail free cards um, on that journey to allow them to you know, communicate in some of the ways that they're currently doing. I think, is it George Lakoff who writes about framing and the importance of framing messages? So I guess that runs through all of these different mm -hmm. characteristics. Yeah, so I think his uh, work is on language in particular, right? And the associations that you might have with language. So for example, you, you might call it a death tax if you want to invoke one response or um, uh, an equality tax if you're on the other side. Yeah. Um, or a surrender deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, we, we make the similar inferences based on language too that we make about messenger traits. So we can see in language warmth, we recognize dominance. Um, and especially if there's, you know, in text messages, emoticons and exclamation marks and big hearts and that kind of thing, then uh, we, we, we do. We, we infer traits about what the, the message is communicating. Um, is that what you meant on later yeah, yeah, point? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think it's that how you, you know, how you do get a message across, as, even as a dominant person, how you might frame it in a way that speaks to an audience that might not necessarily be your you know, uh, initial obvious constituency. Mm -hmm. Cool, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, so I've got a couple at the front here. So my question is about who society doesn't listen to. And I think it's fair to say that most people, when they're looking for opinions or news sources, look to those sources that are already aligned with their kind of thinking. But what struck me is when I've asked friends who are, are researchers or academics if, if they're on the left, but they also read right-wing newspapers or vice versa, they're, they're much less likely to do that or, or no more likely than I am. So um, what, how can you explain that or what is the rationale behind people who are in the business of research and in the business of thinking of alternatives that they're just like me? <laughs> and there was a question behind you while we're in the same area. Uh, hello. Um, I wondered if your research showed any trends in terms of the contacts or audiences in which or to which uh, particular forms of connection work better or work worse. Great. I'll take the second one first. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. There is, you know, there are studies documenting the liberal bias in academia. And I can attest myself to being a liberal academic and not reading the Daily Mail or the Sun. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it's the same reason that whoever does. We're, we're still people, even though I guess we're meant to be seeking objective truths. In my free time, then I will kind of go to the news sources I trust and actually enjoy reading. Um, and I, I get infuriated by, by those that I don't. Um, so I think that's fair, that's a fair point. And uh, there is a movement actually, um, spearheaded partly by Jonathan Haidt, who's um, another social psychologist, um, who's trying to push forward a kind of more balanced agenda, I guess, in academia. Um, but in terms of who we don't listen to more generally, I think one of the really striking things that we kind of uncovered in the book was um, the effect of dehumanization on vulnerable messengers. So, you know, we talk about the identifiable victim effect, and it's the idea that a single identifiable victim is, um, engages your moral responsibility in a way that a large group doesn't. So Joseph Stalin said, um, the death of one Russian soldier is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. Um, and that's very true. However, we always walk past homeless people on the street here in London, and they are very identifiable, and you can see them suffering, and yet, 
most people just walk right on by. Um, and there's research showing that actually when people look at um, homeless people and drug addicts, there are parts um, of their brain that actually uh, usually represent areas associated with social cognition, so assigning a mind to another person. Um, and these areas of the brain light up less when they look at these groups, these stigmatized groups. So what's going on is they're actually dehumanizing them, taking away their mind in a sense to make them feel less empathetic. So I think that's what's going on, is that in order to avoid empathizing with these groups who they have a motivation not to, then we dehumanize them and subsequently don't listen to their request for help in this instance. So coming on the, on, on, on the second point that was, that, that was made here, it, it, it strikes me that there's, and probably unsurprised for two psychologists to actually say this, that context matters an awful lot when we decide who uh, or, or why we're going to pay attention to a certain messenger or a certain characteristic. You know, so um, you know, if, if we're ill, do we, do we prefer the hard-nosed medic who isn't perhaps that bothered about how we might be feeling about things, but is pretty good at you know, you know, prescribing the treatment, regardless of how uncomfortable it might be that will get us well? Or would, would we prefer the counsel of a, perhaps a warmer doctor that may not necessarily you know, be that motivated to uh, make us that uncomfortable, but perhaps we might have a slightly less effective treatment as a result? You know, that, there's a context which might influence whether we uh, seek a, a harder or a softer messenger. There's been some really interesting studies in organizations as well that show how the environment that an organization finds itself in has a significant influence over the appointments, the senior appointments that boards will make in those organizations. So, you know, for example, uh, an organization that is perhaps uh, not doing so well, uh, perhaps has suffered in reductions of its share price and its value, uh, perhaps there are lower levels of psychological safety amongst uh, the staff and the people that actually work there. When it comes to appointing senior leaders to that organization, boards are significantly more likely to appoint and recruit a dominant, harder type of executive in those contexts. But by contrast, if that same organization is doing well, you know, there are you know, largely, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that's performing well, the future looks good, the future looks rosy, uh, there's high levels of psychological safety, that same board will be more inclined to appoint a much more connected, warm uh, executive in those instances. So um, whilst these traits um, we find to be universal, um, who or what we might pay attention to at a given moment in time will often be dependent on that environment or that context we find ourselves in. I think we've hinted at this idea, which, which I explore quite a lot in the work we're doing here at the RSA, is around, you know, we all have limited bandwidth uh, in terms of cognitive bandwidth and our ability to process information in a world of information overload. So how, how we can find the time and the capacity to engage with alternative arguments or viewpoints is, is I think, one of the core questions of the day. And that's only going to get worse. Mm. Yeah, completely. Um, and that, so I've got a question here. I'm looking to see if there's any women in the room who want to ask a question. Cool. So we've got one at the front here. Uh, and I, I think on that, there's a, there's a really good example, this idea that we don't listen to some people. There's a great example I think you touched on in the book, which you can get a copy of later, um, uh, about a guy who was predicting the 2008 crash and just wasn't heard in terms of his forecasting, which... So, so there are people out there who have got something important to say who just aren't getting through, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, th that's the classic example of uh, what we describe as the Cassandra effect, or the, cas the curse of Cassandra. Here's a messenger, an individual that has facts, uh, evidence to back up these facts, has a good, credible story and message to present, but the features of them as a messenger result in their information, their, their message, their story being widely dismissed. Yet someone else can come along with the exact same message. Uh, nothing is different about what's being said and it be enthusiastically embraced. Not because of the message, but because of who, um, in this case, the, the, the entity is actually delivering it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a great story. So I had a question at the front. Yes, so I was thinking about what you said now about the boards and, and what kind of CEO they, 
they choose when the, the organization is doing well or not well. And I was thinking about myself being a mother and having two small children and when things are going well or not well in the way I behave. And is it that? So when it's not going well, I want to be dominant. And when it's going well, I'm, I'm taking it quite relaxedly. Do the children or even the workers need that dominance when it's not going well? Or is it us believing that we need dominance? I think it's the latter because, well, this, I mean, there'll, there'll be an element of both. So I guess if somebody's misbehaved, then you want to punish them, might make you angry. Um, but what, the reason I say the latter is because actually in times where people have done nothing wrong themselves, but yet there is social conflict, competition and uncertainty, they look to elect dominant leaders. Um, whereas if everything's going swimmingly and everything's calm, not through any extraordinary work that they've done, but then they look to somebody who will promote cooperation and is a bit more socially harmonious. Is that the way, is it better to have a dominant leader in, oh, in the situation of insecurity? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. could you, or is it us as human beings believing that it's better? Yeah, I see what you're saying. There's, and there's probably an element of both. Um, so I think the bias aspect comes in under this idea of the individual success hypothesis, which is that we elect leaders who we think on their own would do well. So a dominant leader in a social conflict um, would make sense because they might be able to kind of combat the opposition. But what we fail to take into account there is that actually it often requires um, promoting cooperation within the group. And, you know, then they're going to be managing people and they have to get, get a harmony within their own team, um, in which case dominant messengers are sometimes not great. But then again, you know, you have cases like uh, I think you, you're kind of alluding to where there is a social conflict and people want to rally behind a dominant leader who is going to lead them into battle in a sense. Um, and in that case, I, yeah, I agree. It's, it's probably there for an evolutionary reason and it is probably adaptive in that sense. So uh, a kind of double-edged answer there, I guess. Maybe a couple more questions. I've got one in the front here. And let's take the lady in the second row. Hi. Um, in light of uh, what you've just said so far, in terms of uh, me as an individual or as individuals, what are the kind of things we need to be more aware of to stop us being deceived? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Let's just take this question over yeah. here as well. Um, first, a, a comment, I suppose, that two seems very limited and doesn't allow for a lot of shades of grey or combinations of bits of one and bits of the other, which I see. Um, and the other is that I work for an organisation where we're encouraged to flex our communication style depending on our audience. Um, and to what extent do you see these characteristics as being fixed or to what extent can you uh, alter your, your own approach depending on who you're addressing? Okay. So I think the first question was largely about uh, awareness of and, 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 and defence of. And there's, um, so here's the answer I'd like to be able to give. And the answer I'd like to be able to give is that uh, if we all knew a little bit more and became a little bit more savvy about how these often automatic, unconscious reactions to these kind of traits, if we, if we knew a little bit more about them, we would be able to adequately defend ourselves against them. Um, I'd like to be able to say that. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that um, we can do that. Um, and one of the reasons is uh, for... Uh, what Ian set out a few months ago is our world is a crazy information overloaded sea of stimulus. Uh, so to be able to kind of get that cognitive bandwidth to be able to, you know, ask the question, do we need uh, to pay attention? Is there a red flag here with this, with this messenger? Um, I think is going to be pretty difficult. I, I, I don't think knowing about these things is going to harm us. It'll certainly put us perhaps uh, arguably in a slightly better position than those that uh, that, that don't recognize them. But I do think we need help. And, and here, I think, um, that help might be or come in the form of policies or programs that allow us to at least um, be exposed to signals of perhaps the trustworthiness of, of a new source or a messenger source. Um, I'd, what that might look like, I don't know. But, you know, in, in much the same way as we get help from... Um, you know, 
about the food choices we make. You know, there, there are traffic light systems on uh, food to tell us whether something is good or not so good or largely kind of benign for us. Uh, maybe there's a conversation to be had about whether we should be doing that with, with news platforms, whether we should be doing that with, with social media platforms as, as well to determine whether when we are exposed to a piece of information, when we're exposed to some form of message, um, what is the relative trustworthiness of that? You know, I know we have things like trust pilot and things like that, but I think we could probably go a little bit further than that. Maybe even look to see if we could even offer some forms of incentives so that the truth does rise uh, to the top um, and those kind of falsehoods and fake news stories are likely to, to languish in, in those feeds that we're presented with. And there's a point about are there shades of grey in between mm. the different yeah, yeah. characteristics? So, I, yeah, I think absolutely. And I don't actually see them as these kind of fixed effects, so you're going to be one of these eight traits. Um, in fact, probably it's more the case that there are eight dials and every person has their own profile where you might be high on dominance, low on vulnerability, high on attractiveness, for example. Um, but... In the research, typically what we want to do is isolate the effect of one trait and then look at the effect that that has on the people's responses. So I guess that's how it's typically been studied, but not actually how human, humans operate and how we perceive others. On the, if, I may, just, if, I, if I may briefly, uh, on the subject of these dials and, and where perhaps we all rate across these, these, these effects, um, I would draw your attention to... Uh, a wonderful little online test that was actually developed by one of our researchers, uh, Eloise Copland, um, where you can actually go online. It, it's, it's a free test. It takes five or six minutes, and it will give you a sense of uh, where your priorities and preferences lie for the type of messenger uh, that you are. So that might be a useful thing. Um, might actually also help with the um, customizing of those kind of messages that you're actually put, your organization is putting out. Um, so that's, that's freely available online. Uh, so we'll take a couple more questions. While, while the mics go around, um, have you found any evidence of what I might describe as proximity to the messenger as having an effect? In the sense, I'm always amazed that um, when you see Vox Pops in high streets, people are always opinionated about folk they've never met. And it always intrigues me as to how you could have such strong feelings about you know, national or global figures who you've just never encountered. So I just wonder if... if like the more you get to know someone, or is, is, is there a sort of a distance proximity effect? And then I'll take a couple of questions while you think about that. Uh, I've got one right at the back, and then let's have one at the side over here. Sorry. Uh, you used to phrase universal uh, quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I find that quite problematic. Um, and I was kind of wondering where you've been doing your research in, in like geographically, cultural terms, um, and some of the study, studies that you've been citing, because uh, to me, as a student of these disciplines, I can think of examples that would, or, or, or situations, cultures, where you're not necessarily gonna get these traits, characteristics, operating in the same way that you seem to be implying that they will. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I accept. Uh, I think your, your point is, in, is entirely fair and valid. Um, there are, uh, towards the end of the book, actually, we talk about how these uh, certain traits actually play out in, in different cultures, and there clearly is a, a cultural uh, impact and influence that, that um, is going on there. Um, but I'd also point out that what we're describing here are reliable traits that seem to have um, a human characteristic primarily first, and then the context of culture might influence the, the results as well. And so, you know, for example, there's, the, there's, there's, um, there's a study that looks at um, how school children react when uh, they do a good piece of work at school, and they, they find that, you know, children from the kind of individualistic cultures, let's say Canada or North America, um, are far, far more inclined to kind of boast about their achievements, talk about how, what a great job that they actually did. And where in contrast in uh, Asian cultures, more collective type of cultures, um, they would be much, much less likely to, to boast about their 
own attainment and largely assign it to, you know, this, this is, you know, uh, a quality of the group. So I do accept that those uh, cultural variances add an important uh, context and layer to this. Um, but I'd also suggest that what we're actually looking at here are the, the overarching humanistic traits as opposed to specific cultural ones in that instance. But it's a valid point. It's absolutely a valid point. Yeah, and, and we do try actually to include large-scale cross-cultural studies. Um, and I think we have one that I really like because it's, they did two studies, two separate papers, one in big cities around the world. So you've got London, Tokyo, um, and the US, Paris, um, I think Africa too. And, uh, and then there's another one where you've got small-scale farming communities in Ecuador and <laughs> these kind of places. And they essentially asked them about a lot of these traits. And what was actually really striking was that um, across cultures, then there seemed to be these correlations existing. Um, so that was kind of one of their main findings, was that um, we tend to view the same things as desirable um, across culture. And the one that came to the top, surprisingly, was trustworthiness. So it might surprise you, might not. Um, I was a little bit surprised, but in, a, in, in looking at it, I guess it makes sense in that what they were asking was, which would you most value in other people and as well in yourself? But in other people, you particularly want to know that if you're cooperating with them, they're going to have your back. Because if not, then you're completely left in the lurch and actually everything you thought you were working towards is going to kind of reverse against you and you're going to have the exact opposite outcome. So in that sense, I think it makes sense, which also brings to the, the for the question, does it matter on the context? And again, we cite another kind of, uh, not cross-cultural one, but a large meta-analysis that was conducted on celebrities um, and their advertising endorsements. And what that found was that um, where warmth and generosity were valued in other people, it was much lower on the list in what you look for in endorsing celebrity. And actually now, attractiveness rises into the top three. So there you can see why you know, we might not value in a friend how attractive they are. We might say we, you know, we, might, we just might not care. We might like people for who they are. Um, but in the context of buying a product from a celebrity, we are more likely to be influenced by attractiveness there. So I, we do try and get into it. And I, I agree. It's a, a kind of point that is well made and worth exploring. Um, I guess right. we had, yeah. so I had a couple more. One right at the back and one over here. Let's take your question first. Very, very simply, um, one thing you haven't really spoken about so far is, I guess, racism and that kind of prejudice. And I'm wonder, wondering how that feeds into and interacts with this question of who society really listens to and how we perceive um, so-called traits, what you're calling traits. Mm -hmm. And there was one over here. Uh, it feels like a uh, quite an... It's obvious question, but I don't think you've touched on it. Is, is there a correlation between different political values and different styles of communication? So if you're more authoritarian, you might prefer messaging, which seems to come from a dominant uh, kind of communicator. If you're more liberal, you prefer messaging that's delivered in that kind of with uh, warmth. And if so, is that part of what's kind of trapping us in different political tribes? Um, so, for the race question, I think our answer is, is similar in a way to the, the question about gender, which is that, one, we are the wrong messages to be talking about it because we've never actually experienced it ourselves, I think is, is kind of worth us saying up front. Um, and two, that, um, you know, having researched the book, we did find empirical work on the subject, um, which showed that underneath these kind of surfal surface level social categorizations that we typically talk about with bias, there are differences in the inferences people are making about these traits. So um, about competence and warmth in particular, um, where actually you can see um, in large field, field studies that if you, you have a separate people rate, for example, how warm and competent they think uh, names from different cultures are, so they, I think they had Asian names, they had Asian American names, and then they had African names and African American names. Um, they could predict how likely people were to get a job based on these traits of warmth and competence there. And I can send you the kind of studies if you're interested. I thought they were fascinating, but um, didn't 
end up being included in the book, um, just for time and, and space yeah. reasons. And, and just briefly, you're, you're, you're correct, generally. What we find is that, um, so for those Republican types of uh, demeanors and audiences, they, th the evidence generally suggests that they do prefer that uh, more authoritarian, dominant, competent type of, uh, of, of, of messenger there, uh, a softer type of messenger uh, uh, in, in, in the liberal camps. I mean, I, I probably the best, you know, kind of summarized by um, opposites may attract, but birds of a feather flock together much, much more um, uh, than, than opposites attract. We are tribes. Yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. I've been watching, just looking at the clock over there, but I think it might be a little slow. Anyway, um, if we have overrun slightly, thank you for s staying with what has been a fascinating conversation. I know uh, Joe and Mark are going to stop back. Uh, if anybody wants to follow up any questions you didn't have a chance to ask, or if you want to get a copy of the book, which has definitely got uh, a massive number of insights in there. Um, finally, can I thank you all for coming and ask you to thank uh, Steve and Joe for today's talk. Thank you.